Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be up here with Daniel Liebeskin. Thank, Thank you. you, Daniel, for great coming to be up here. here with you, John, and in Montreal, one of my favorite cities, absolutely. It, uh, it's great up here. Um, Daniel, you are one of the world's great architects. Uh, you uh, have designed buildings all over the world, of course. Uh, your Jewish museum in Berlin is probably your most iconic building. Um, but here in Canada, you've also designed the... Uh, the uh, Michael Leach in Crystal in, at the Royal Ontario Museum in a city that I think somewhat to the yes. <laughs> west of here. I forget the name for the moment. <laughs> uh, as well as the uh, wonderful and stark Military History Museum in Dresden, uh, the Imperial War Museum in uh, Manchester, uh, the Hamilton Building at the Denver Art Museum. I'm just citing museums because I want to talk about museums. And museums, by definition, are places of memory. And so somehow I think of you in a very deep sense as an architect of memory. Well, look, uh, most people think memory is a memorial or something that happened in the past, usually a tragedy. But to me, memory is the foundation of architecture. Without memory, you have Alzheimer's cities, cities where nobody knows where they come from, where they're going. So memory is not a footnote. Uh, memory is if you think about it, really the key to our orientation in the world. And so every building, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a museum, has to have an aspect of being memorable and being tied to something which is not sort of just surface. Right. What happens in a, and we've had this discussion before, but maybe for this, this audience, what happens in a new city? What is the role of memory in a totally new city, like, like King Abdullah Economic City in, in Saudi Arabia or Iskandar in Malaysia? Uh, it's an interesting question, uh, John, because actually there is no tabula rasa in the world. There is no place which is just a blank sheet. You know, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to the desert, and... Borges wrote the Book of Sand, showing that really even sand has memory. There's nothing in this world that we live in that is not part of a greater history, history that goes beyond our lifetime, history that moves backwards and often goes through nature and through things that really are part of our own history. So I would say that King Abdullah Economic City, you know, it, it seems to be in the desert, it's on the Red Sea, but if you look at the paths of commerce, if you look at the paths of immigration, you look at paths of settlement in Jeddah and sort of around on the other side of the Red Sea, you see that it is not a tabula rasa. It has traces, and those traces can be used in design of the city. So I don't believe in a city that is just imposed by importing it from another place. There are many people who just say, let's take a good example of a city, New York. We are in, I don't know, somewhere in a foreign place that has no city. Let's take the grid of New York and put it there, and it's gonna be New York. But you know, we often find that this is just a fatal mistake because no New York is produced and just a terrible city uh, emerges. So there is no way to just abstractly import an idea from another place. You have to use the history, the memory of a place, and that's really uh, the poetic task. We forget that Cities create, were created uh, out of something that, that also makes us part of that city. You know, if you grow up in a grid city, your mind is in a grid. You grow up in a circular city, your mind is in a circle. You grow in a meander city, your, mi uh, your mind is in a meander. We're affected by the cities, we don't even know it, but they're part of mental health as well. Interesting point. But going back to museums, which really are the places of memory in a, in a, in a, in a very fundamental sense, um, some of the, the museums you've designed uh, were conceived, in a way, in a pre-digital age. Yeah, of I course. mean, if you, the Jewish Museum in Berlin was, it opened in 1989. No, is, open, it, actually, officially yeah. opened to the public 2001. Sorry, 2001. But it but, is true. But it's conceived before the, the, really the onslaught, so to speak, of uh, digital media, etc. So the question I have is that, how are these institutions really now adapting to this pervasively digital environment that we have? And that, will that change the design process going on? Of course, uh, that's true. I designed, I think uh, the Jewish Museum may be the last building designed completely by hand. There are more than a thousand windows, each is a three-dimensional form. They were all calculated with a logarith you know, logarithmic uh, ruler. And when the designers of the exhibits came many years later and said, you know, can you give us the drawings of the museum? 
So I sent them, a, you know, I just, you know, copied some drawings. They said, no, no, we want the digital model. We want the 3D model. I said, there is no 3D model. It's all sections, plants, elevations. It's, it's a building like a building of the Renaissance. They said, oh my God, how are we going to reconstruct the interior of the building? We have to take all the measurements, put them in a computer. But to answer your question, John, it is true. The Jewish Museum, for example, today, uh, government has appropriated $25 million to transform the exhibits. Because when it opened, it had no interactive oh. at all. There was nothing interactive, and Berlin was quite behind at that time also. And, of course, digital technology is a key to the success of a contemporary museum, of a contemporary experience. So uh, every museum has to create a balance between its space, its physical, visceral, let's say, emotional space, and the space that we are also decoding as a virtual space, which is space on our tablet space, of a representation in different modes. So yes, it's very important. Right. And how does this, won't this affect how we think about how we measure in the future the success of a cultural edifice, of a museum? Because it's not simply perhaps the number of visitors, but uh, very few museums today, for example, uh, look seriously at how to measure satisfaction, the retention of visual information, etc. And is there some kind of inevitability about uh, metrics, digital metrics, and cultural spaces that we're going to have to take, that designers and architects will now have to take into account? For sure. Well, look, art, and, and museums deal with art and history and with kind of the wonders of the world. If you want to take metrics of everything, I, I, I'm an av avid user of the Amazon app to buy books. And I'm sometimes astonished I look at a, you know, a book I want, let's say a special edition of, of my favorite, you know, Hamlet, and I see seven fingers like this, seven, nine up like this. And so I think of Donald Trump. I think, you know, this is how he targets audiences. He finds out what do the audience want to know about, we'll give it to them. So museums are a little bit different. You have to satisfy the public, you have to make the public engaged, but you also have to give something authentically an authentic experience that might be provocative, might be surprising, might be unexpected. And that's really the role of the architecture and, and the content of a museum. Look, the last museum, I would say, of the 20th century, in terms of its idea, ideology of modernism, is Mies van der Rohe, the German architect, National Gallery in Berlin, you know, the, the, the glass box with the underground. When Mies built it, it's interesting, you know, it's got all glass all around. Uh, Werner Haftmann, who was the professor in charge of the museum, said to him, well, it's a beautiful building, Mr. Van der Rohe, but what do I do with the art? And he said, don't ask me, I'm the architect. <laughs> but if you know that museum, the art is in the underground. It's in a black box in the basement of the museum. So upstairs you've got the glass box, and downstairs you've got the basement. And in a way, that's the typology that developed negatively, in my view, out of modernism. You've got either the glass box, the white box, the black box, but you're boxed in by a kind of division of an experience. So to answer your question, I think a museum has to measure satisfaction of its audiences in inventive ways. And to me, a museum that I would like to, you know, if I think of what is a museum that really is good, a museum that resembles a creative process. For example, if you were to design, think of a museum, whether it's a science museum, history museum, art museum, whatever it is, think of the studio of Picasso. You know, he's got his paintings, but he's got books. He's got other works of art that he's collected over the years that inspire him. He's got all sorts of little objects that were part of his experience. He's got some memorable things in the drawers. So, yeah, he enters a space of the creative, and I think that's the key, to empower the citizen to be creative in a museum. Otherwise, museums are just for the elite or for just entertainment. And by the way, empowering people to be creative in a museum is not just a word. It's not just giving them the information. Because, for example, I'm always very annoyed and think it's a terrible idea to give people earphones in the Museum of Modern Art or something. And they go around the museum and they have a historian tell them about the importance of a Cezanne painting which really kills the Cezanne paintings. I mean, who, you know, it, it's, it's not the Cezanne painting that is speaking to them. It's, it's a secondary, tertiary voice 
of, simula of the simulacrum which is acting on them. So I would take away all those earphones from the public. I would give them a complete different kind of education in the museum. Of course, as Walter Benjamin said, the aura of the work of art is gone. You know, with technology, right? With, you know, there is no more aura. The art doesn't have any aura. It's just a commercial product. But I think you can, and good museums and great museums do do it. They recover the, you know, the, the primary experience of the work of art with incredible information, education, that can really inspire the person looking at it with a satisfaction that they've had an experience that is worthwhile. Right. Now, uh, museums don't exist you know, in a vacuum. They're, they're, they're very 99% of the time urban buildings. They exist in an urban context. One of the premises, one could say, of the New Cities Foundation is not to think of cities as collections of uh, individual buildings, but as, as, as a kind of whole. And how are you, for example, adapting to this think thinking? Because some of the criticism, of course, of uh, this architect uh, 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 system is that there's probably too much focus on the building itself out of context. Uh, rather than thinking of the building in a greater sort of urban context, in an aesthetic, cultural, economic, uh, uh, social context. So has your thinking been shifting over the last decade on this? No, I think it's been reinforced by the attack on architecture. You know, people say, oh, star architect. My son is an astrophysicist. He's an expert in black holes. There are billions of stars. We just don't see them. Buildings that are not stars are just mediocre buildings, buildings that supposedly are contextual. Now, what does that mean? You know, we assume that we know what the context is. The context is a street. It's got a front. It's got a law. It's got a height. It's got a certain material. And when a building slightly departs from it, we say, wow, that's a star building. That's not a building that belongs on the street. You know, recently I read a, a study by Harvard Business School on innovation. They asked the question, what is to be innovative? It's a great question. And all these experts, business and otherwise, came to the following conclusion. We cannot define innovation. There's no way that anyone can define what innovation is. But we can define the exact opposite of innovation. Imitation. Imitation is the opposite of innovation. If you think of cities, if you think of the so-called context of cities, mostly it's an imitation. It's an imitation of the building next. It's an imitation of the architecture of previous time. It's an imitation. It's just an imitation. And cities are probably the greatest reinforcers of imitative behavior in the world. I mean, you don't have to put people in Guantanamo. You just bring them to a particular city, and they will just take on the characteristics of that space, both negatively and mentally. So my view is that architecture is very important. It's a key to, to, you know, whether it's an apartment building, whether it's a shopping center, whether it's a museum, whether it's a, it's a park or a children's playground. The architecture is key. But of course, we have to see the city also as something which is greater than the sum of its parts, of course. And that means, what is that? What is the sum that is greater than its parts in a city? It's one thing. It's not public space. It's public realm. What is accessible? to the public as a realm that the public owns. It's not just here is a designated park that has no shadows. Here is a designated space where you can walk without having to pay a fee. Public realm is the feeling of being a citizen with the freedom and liberty that the city offers you. To me, that is the key to a really a good city, the public realm. How much of that public realm exists in a city? We, are, we know many cities that look great as a whole, well-designed as a whole, but are really enclaves that are controlled in ways that is pretty obvious economically, through economic injustice, through various systems that divide the city and make it less democratic. And For example, the, the divide between you know, the, you know, those who can afford to live in a neighborhood, those who cannot afford to live in a neighborhood. I mean, I think, getting back to Montreal, I think, I mean, I, I, I feel sure that you will agree with me that Montreal is one global city that has, is particularly successful in the way it has managed public spaces. We just have to look outside at Absolutely. the Place des Arts and the Carte des Spectacles. It's extraordinary. Not only Montreal, Canada is a progressive country. I have to say Montreal you know, has immigrants, people from all over who are accepted. It, it's a nurturing society. Canada today, with a new prime minister, is a pro progressive country. 
country that that is enlightened, that that is future oriented. So yes, I agree with you. It's really about sensibility. And when we talk about Montreal, when we talk about Canada, we also talk about the the balance between the disappearance of nations and the reappearance of cities. You know, I mean, during the World Cup, everybody's talking about nations. Suddenly, you know, it's Hungary, it's Croatia, it's the UK. But really, in reality, we don't think of the world that way anymore. Even though some people would like to build walls and let us again experience a divisive world of nationality. But it's going back, in reality, to a world that is competitive because cities are the creative places where people want to be. They can get jobs, they can get educated. There's just more opportunity in cities. And so I'm a great believer that uh, cities have to be in that competition. And I think Montreal, definitely, there was an era in which Montreal was on the forefront of the global cities. I think, it, you know, for a while it got a little tired, but I think today, with New Cities Foundations, <laughs> <laughs> it it's, it's, has a good chance to reappropriate that designation for itself. And that has a lot to do with civic pride, civic architecture, public realm, and just attractiveness. Yes, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you, and that's why we're here in Montreal. How much are you, do you track uh, developments in materials science uh, in the context of buildings and new building processes? Um, yeah, also, the importance of green buildings and, and energy efficiency. How important is that to you? I mean, will we see in the future buildings be increasingly off-grid? Uh, I think of the example of the Toledo uh, Museum of Heart in, in Ohio, whose solar panels now have made it for the last decade essentially completely off-grid. They, they do their own electricity. Look, is my first building, I think my first building, which was the Jewish Museum in Berlin, was the first building to have a completely green roof. A total, a real green roof, not like a little thin green roof where birds and, you know, ecology uh, of, of nature can happen on that building. It was not required by law to that extent. Uh, reality has caught up. People have realized that, that it's important to understand what the environment is and in what way buildings can create a very negative relationship. I think one would have to be really uh, very stupid not to apply all the forces of knowledge for sustainability and ecology. Uh, but that goes, a matter of fact, you know, I built a shopping center in Las Vegas, which is one of the highest grades. I'm building a building in Germany, a university, which has the highest... Uh, ratings in energy in Europe, actually, and supported by European Union, by Germany, by all sorts of um, uh, communities. So that's very important. But one thing that, uh, that I must point out, that many people think that green buildings is about architecture. It has nothing to do with architecture. Green buildings are not about an aesthetic of putting a tree on top of a building. It's about how a building breathes and behaves over a period of time and how it is built, how well it is built. So green building is not a style of architecture. It's not, you cannot identify green building, and many people would like you to believe that green building looks this way because it's got the style of the green building, but that's only the style of green building. So of course, I'd like to see a tree in a building that's nicer than seeing just a you know, metal facade, but uh, sustainability goes far much further because it goes to how spaces are used. Let me give you an example. Uh, I have built many public buildings, and the building I'm referring to for a university has many large halls, many large spaces. To make a sustainable building, those spaces have to be used 24 hours, seven days a week. You cannot have a hall for 500 people or 1,000 people, which is used three times a week, because that's a complete waste of money and of energy. You have to have that space that can be broken down to smaller spaces. They can be used all the time. Because otherwise, you've built a folly. You've built a building. And many buildings that we admire are follies. They've got big spaces, very impressive, but used really in a very uneconomical way. So sustainability has to do with how you think of the building's life. Who uses the building? Who has access to the building? How is the building contributing to a betterment uh, you know, of, of the experience or of social purpose? And in that sense, of course, sustainability goes much beyond just materiality of a building. It goes for the social idea of what a building represents in a city or wherever it is located. Daniel, I would love to actually open up to maybe a couple of questions, because I think I'm sure people, some people would like to ask Daniel uh, a, a few things. Are there any, anybody 
like to say anything? Just think about it for a second while I ask you one last question, and that is, Please. many people don't know that you were trained as a musician before you trained as an architect. And I still think of you as I mean, you someone who loves music. How does that inform the work you do in physical design? Well, I can uh, tell you, well, that's true. I, I consider architecture just an extension of music, not the other way around. Music is the fundamental thing in life. Everything else is derived from music. Even breathing, you know, you know is a form, uh, you know, the heartbeat is the form of music, really. And music is about life and death. It's not just about entertainment. Uh, so everything I do in architecture has to do with music, and, and that's my background. Uh, but recently, just a few weeks ago, in uh, Frankfurt, in Germany, I had a chance to, to do a project of my own. They asked me to do a project in Frankfurt. My idea was called One Day in Life, to create a 24-hour performance, so 75 performances with hundreds of musicians, open to the public, performed in places where music has never been played. It's hard to get those places, like the, the surgery room in the biggest hospital, you know, the, the swimming pool, the largest swimming pool in Germany, you know, the boxing ring where young kids get trained, you know, in, the, in poor neighborhoods, uh, the bunker, uh, you know, buildings, uh, in, uh, for example, in the, in the subway station, not music, uh, not street musicians performing, but performances. I, get, I had the, the idea to get you know, Mozart's Requiem, one of my favorite pieces of music. I never wanted to hear it in Salzburg, in a, in a church. I said, it's, you know, the music is fundamentally about people working and dying. It's about life. It's about, I wanted to have it performed in a factory. How lucky that, that Germany, such an advanced society, allowed performance, really, at the big transit hall where they fix you know, railways and trams. And in the horizon, you could see the trains departing and arriving, you know, on the horizon of life, just like in the Requiem, you know, the trains uh, departing and arriving. So, you know, music is also, I don't see it only in the concert hall. Of course, we I did have a concert of Lachenmann, you know, music that was booed even during my, you know, I had a concert in the biggest hall, 2,500 people in Frankfurt. Lachenmann, who wrote this piece in 1965 or 1970, uh, one of the greatest contemporary, there was somebody who booed, and I said, you know, this is fantastic, that somebody can boo a piece of music written in 1965, 1970, would make this very elderly musician in his late 80s probably very happy. So again, music, <laughs> and, music and architecture, music and space, city. You know, and I was asked recently by, by Carnegie Hall, you know, could I do something you know, like that in New York? What, what, what would you do in New York? And I've been thinking about it, but I think these fields, City, city, space, spaces that are often not available for full performance. Uh, I even had a performance in Schindler's House, oh. uh, which is right at the railway station, at the center, central railway station of, of Frankfurt, one of the biggest, like the, kind of the red light district of Frankfurt. So yes, I think cities and music are very closely connected. And it's not just the walls of Jericho that came down tumbling but the walls of Thebes were built through music, according to the, the legends. Uh, so music has been underestimated, I think. Of course, rock and roll and popular music and rap and so on is, is very popular, attracts thousands of people. But to attract people to serious classical music, and this was considered only of serious classical music, both ancient and contemporary. Contemporary meaning written in the last 50 years. It's not that new. Uh, and it attracted thousands and thousands of people. Because when it started, I said to the authorities, how many people are going to show up for this concert, for this series of you know, 18 places? Because and, and, you could only do 10 of them at, at most. Otherwise, you could, you know, time is too short. I said, maybe 10 people will arrive. They said, don't worry. This is Germany. This is Frankfurt. And surely, thousands and thousands of people showed up, even to their last performance, which was in the stadium, the biggest stadium in Germany. And I, my idea was to have a single violinist performing, a single brilliant violinist performing the works of you know, Paganini, contemporary works of Ligeti, and so on. So you, know, you have the people, and the, the stadium was not full. There were, there were not 60,000 people there, but there were thousands. I think it's good to reproportion the space of the city with music. Great idea. Is there maybe one question we have time for? Madam, can we have the 
microphone. Knew you were going to ask a question. Thank you. So, Daniel, I'd like to go back to your themes of um, urban memory, which is both to do with spatial and it's to do with form. And to connect those to your comments about innovation and um, imitation, and if I heard you correctly, and perhaps I was wrong, you have a positive spin about innovation in architecture. And I heard a kind of less admirable tone, less admiring tone about imitation. So if we were to swap the word replication for imitation, which is a more neutral word, but it has to do with rhythmic patterning. It means the uh, perpetuation of something that is tried and tested and um, reassuring and familiar. Would you um, not agree that with your proposition that uh, the poetry of urban experience is important in reinforcing urban memory, that there is uh, a really valid place for replication? Well, it's an interesting question, whether patterning and using the idea of pattern as a pattern of memory, whether that's really something creative or something habitual, whether it's a shackle of the free or whether it's really opening the possibilities. I would uh, say something which I believe is behind your question. I wouldn't worry about the unusual because 90% of the world, maybe 98% of it, is the gray background. It'll always stay the great background. We have to elicit more people with creativity to break that 98% or 95% to, to be involved in creating things that we don't expect. And I think the great cities, look, uh, let, let's go to, to, to a city that you all know, Athens, right? First of all, Athens was built by a musical performance. You know, the threshing floor of Athens was first a dance and a piece of music which was stabilized hundreds of years later into a series of paths which are made into roads, which are made into vistas, which created uh, sacred spaces and temples. But really, it is about creativity. So I am not a believer in pattern reading. I'm actually against the pattern. I think the pattern is used very successfully by authoritarian governments because they want to make you a pattern. Whether they are authoritarian in an old-fashioned way or whether they are late capitalist, societies based simply on greed and profit. The pattern is clear. Pattern does not allow people to grow. And what is growth? Growth has an anarchic moment to it. There is something that we can't expect out of a child, just comes out because it's free. And I want to say one more thing, this is important, that cities were based because of liberty, the origins of Rome. You know, it's, it's, of course, in the paintings, it's the rape, right? The rape of the Sabine women, right? And the murder, Romulus and Remus, rape and murder are at the base of Rome. But really what it is, is Rome allowed all the outlaws, 3,000 of them, I think, who were not able to get a good place anywhere else, they formed Rome. So kind of immigrants today, I would say, refugees are outlawed by societies. They are, they are not considered part of the norm. So... My basic view is to try to break the pattern. Whether it's a pattern... Look, F Frank Lloyd Wright, what made his genius so fantastic? He was the first architect to challenge the New York City grid. Every architect, slavishly, you know, even Sullivan built in the rectangles of New York City. Came Frank Lloyd Wright, a free mind, he said, I'm going to do Guggenheim as a circle in the grid. People were appalled. You know, this doesn't fit. It's not part of the context of New York. Of course it isn't. But many, many years later, Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim had a big impact on planning of New York. People realized that you can cut through the blocks diagonally, that you can be free. Well, freedom is relative in New York. <laughs> but you can be free of the kind of apparent structure of the city that has been there for some 200 years. So yes, uh, to answer your question bluntly, the more I think about it, the more you have to break the pattern. Now, of course, by breaking the pattern, you create the pattern of breaking the pattern. That's true, that's true too. It's very difficult to maintain it. Daniel, I feel that we could talk for a few hours here, which I would, would love to do, but I'm being told that I cannot, that we cannot. 
Um, all I can say is, one, thank you very much for uh, giving us some of your thoughts. And two, please come back very soon to Montreal thank and you. design some great I, buildings. I have to there. say, Montreal is not far to me. My, Nina's parents, my wife, uh, her mother was born in Montreal. Her father was an immigrant to, move to Montreal from somewhere in the Shtetls. Came, went to McGill, went to, was the first Jew to be allowed to come to Oxford. Uh, our honeymoon was spent here. First day of our honeymoon was spent <laughs> in Montreal. So I have very, you know, I admire Montreal. I admire the, the culture of the city, uh, the beauty of the city, the diversity of the city. And I have to say, though I'm not a Canadian, I admire Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Good. On that note. Thank you. 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 Thank